let's start. Thank you again, Carlos. It's the second lecture. Uh, on the first lecture, we talked about how a blockchain works uh, uh, in the sense that's how, how it reached consensus, where it's consensus, and uh, 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 how the network works, basically. Uh, what's the dynamic of the network? And today we'll, we'll dive even more on how it works. Uh, uh, so yeah, thank you again for, for this opportunity. And please uh, just shoot me questions if you have any as you wish, uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, I don't know if, uh, 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 yeah, I guess I don't have to introduce myself again. Uh, uh, just briefly, my name is Marcelo. I'm the founder CTO of Hatter Labs. We developed our uh, uh, blockchain from scratch. Uh, it's up and running for two years now. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking about blockchain technology and uh, uh, how it, uh, as I see it, how it is gonna change the world. It's been changing and how it's gonna change even more in the next years. So let's just do a quick recap. So on our last class, we started discussing all the discussion with uh, uh, this question, how to integrate an application with a blockchain. And that's exactly what you need to do in your project for, the, for this course. And uh, I wanna give you even more information today of how you can do it and how you can test everything on your end. Uh, okay, so our recap is that everything starts with an application and a blockchain. And from it, it comes the question, what is a blockchain? So a blockchain, you have your application, there's the blockchain, you can write on the blockchain and you can read from the blockchain, but what is the blockchain? So just a quick recap, a blockchain is a distributed, decentralized, and immutable database. And what does it mean again? It's distributed because it runs in a network and the data is distributed across all the network. So each peer of the network, each node of the network has a copy of the data, which in this case is the blockchain. Uh, it's decentralized because there's no central point to make decisions. There's no central decisions. All decisions are made individually by each node and it, uh, 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 they reach consensus through the consensus algorithm that we, we saw last class in, in last lecture. And it's immutable in a sense that after we write to the blockchain and it's confirmed, we cannot delete it, we cannot change it. It's just there written in the, in the blockchain forever. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, last lecture, we discussed deeply how it works, how the network can be dis distributed, decentralized and reach immutability. Uh, uh, another perspective for a blockchain uh, uh, is that we can say that it's a decentralized conflict resolution machine. Uh, 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 on our last lecture, we discussed that the, the main goal of the consensus algorithm is to solve conflicts. And at the time we said that conflicts depends on the network. And today we'll get back to this point and you understand uh, uh, really how, uh, 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 what conflict means uh, for Bitcoin and for Hector. So, and just to finish our quick recap, a blockchain is a zero trust system, which basically means that in the network that connects all the peers of the, of the, all the nodes or the full nodes or the peers that are parts that belongs to a blockchain, uh, uh, no one has to trust any, anyone. So uh, uh, when a new peer runs, when a new peer starts from scratch, the new peer will connect to a few nodes, as you can see here of the network, it downloads the blocks and after it finished downloads, it finished downloading all the blocks, uh, uh, it will use the consensus algorithm to decide which best, which blockchain is the best blockchain. After it's done, the new peer has the same consensus as the rest of the network and uh, uh, it can participate mining, just relaying transactions, relaying blocks, different ways to do this. So basically it's a zero trust system. That's uh, uh, where we ended last lecture. And today uh, uh, we'll get back to the same <clears throat> point we were before. So 
last last time we, we concluded that uh, instead of just a block with blockchain, we have more information now. In fact, we have a full node that we are running. We control this full node. This full node is connected to the peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's connected to other peers, other full nodes of the blockchain. And it's also interacting with our application. Our application can read and can write information through transactions into our full nodes or from our full nodes. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the next question that arrives is, OK, but what is a transaction? In the last lecture, we saw that a transaction is just uh, uh, data is just embedded into transaction. So uh, uh, and now we understand exactly what it means. Uh, uh, what is a transaction? So I'll call it the anatomy of a transaction. So what's the anatomy of a transaction? <clears throat> uh, of course, it depends on the network. Again, each network has its own types of transactions. And even in one network, there are different uh, 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 types of transactions inside a single network. But among all different types that we can see, that you can find, among blockchains, uh, there are two very common models. The UTXO model, which is used by many, many blockchains, including Hetero and Bitcoin. And also there are the account model. The account model uh, is used by Ethereum. Uh, uh, there are other uh, 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 smart contracts, basically the, the networks which uh, uh, works like Ethereum, most of them just use the account model. There's a reason for that, but unfortunately, uh, uh, I'm afraid we won't have time to discuss it today. So for this lecture, we will discuss and we will dive deep into the UTXO model, uh, which is very well known, very, it's used everywhere. Uh, uh, and that, that's where we will, what we'll discuss today. So <clears throat> the UTXO model is used by Hetero and other blockchains. And uh, uh, it's like a model that explains how transactions work or how we can put data inside transactions, uh, what it means and what are the details of a transaction. So again, uh, it all starts with a transactions, with a transaction and a transaction has inputs have, and outputs. So we will understand what it means, but uh, 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 there are other pieces of information that depends specifically on some networks, but on the UTXO model and uh, 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 transactions have inputs and outputs. Outputs store tokens. So uh, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, uh, when you look at the blockchain, you can say, okay, Let's say that I have 100 headers. Where are my headers? Okay, they are in transactions, but what does it mean specifically? And it means that I control, and we will understand how, 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 how it works. I control some outputs. And the sum of the amounts of these outputs is equal to 100 headers. So each transaction has one or more outputs. It might have one, two, three, four, even a hundred outputs. Uh, uh, each network has a, 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 an upper limit, uh, but it's usually a high number. Uh, uh, it's not common to see transactions that uses, that goes to the limits, to the maximum number of outputs. And in this example here, this transaction has three outputs. The first output, the first output uh, uh, owns or controls six headers. Uh, uh, the second output uh, uh, owns, control, or store one header. And the third output controls two token A. So in the UTXO model, you can have different types of tokens for each output, but each output has one and only one type of token. So there are no outputs with, I don't know, two different tokens in a single output. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I've never seen a network 
with this structure. So I'd say that it's, it's I, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's unlikely, it's weird, it's very weird. So, uh, 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 so and Mr. each, go Mr. ahead, That's sorry. a quick question. So when we do sure. a transaction, when we do a transaction, we can have uh, a certain number of headers and one and only one token, and that's all. No, no, no. You can have uh, uh, there's an upper limit for the number of tokens, but each you can have multiple outputs, uh, one or more. Each output has an amount and the token, the type of token. It might be a header but it might be token A, token B, token C. So for instance, uh, uh, you can have a transaction which has, I don't know, let's say six hoppers, just like this in an output. Uh, uh, so in the second output, it has uh, one Carlos token. Uh, in the third output, it has one Marcelo token. And in the next output, let's say it has four outputs, it has another Carlos token. So it's okay to have multiple outputs with the, uh, the same token. Uh, uh, there's no rule for that. What, what matters is that each output has exactly one type of one and just one, and the number of tokens of that. And that the outputs, they are where the funds are stored. So uh, when I say that I have 100 headers, what, what does it mean in the blockchain? It means that there are a set of outputs which the sum of the amounts equals 100 headers. That's what it means. And besides the number of tokens and the type of token, uh, uh, the outputs also have a script. We would skip further, uh, uh, but a script basically decides who can spend this output. So it basically this uh, a script is related to the ownership of that, that that output. So what does it mean that I control an output? Oh, it means that I know how to solve the script. We'll discuss. We'll, we'll see how it works in more details. But yeah, we discussed about outputs. We see a lot of outputs here, but also there are the inputs. And what are the inputs? The inputs. They spend for an output. They spend outputs. So in this example here, what happens is that transaction C has two inputs, input one and input two. In input one, you can see that it points to one outputs of another transaction. In this case, output one of transaction A. So uh, uh, input one is spending output one of transaction A. And input two of transaction C, it's expanding output two of transaction B. So uh, uh, we can see uh, uh, so, uh, uh, some important things. There might be one, two, three, or even 100 inputs. Uh, um, in Hathor, I guess the upper limit is 256 inputs and <clears throat> uh, uh, each input points to an output which belongs to a transaction. So, uh, 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 but it points to the output, not to the transaction. And it gives us uh, uh, an interesting because uh, uh, as the inputs expand outputs, we have a new definition here of unspent transaction outputs, the UTXO. That's where the UTXO model, the name, that's where the name UTXO model comes from. Uh, and what happens here is that in this example here, you can see that on transaction A, the output number one is spent by transaction C, by input one of transaction C. You can see that output two is spent by input two of transaction C. And in this example here, output two, output three from transaction A, both of them, they are not spent. They are unspent, which means they are available to be spent any point in time. And output one as well for transaction B, it's not spent. So it's just waiting to be spent. 
And it's important because it will, it will appear again, because remember when it's discussed that, uh, that we'll get back to this in these slides, but uh, uh, in Bitcoin, uh, 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 that conflict happens when two transactions try to spend the same money. So here we have the, what, what does it mean specifically? Here we know uh, 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 it means that two transactions are trying to spend the same output. So outputs that were spent is just like, uh, it's just like recording the blockchain is just like recording that that money was transferred that, that those tokens were transferred somewhere else and it's done. There's nothing to do with that. What matters in the blockchain that uses UTXO model are the UTXOs, the unspent transaction outputs. So let me rephrase again. When I say that I have 100 hackers, what does it mean? It's not just that I control uh, a set of outputs which the sum is equal to 100 hackers because some of these outputs might have been already spent. So uh, uh, a, a better definition, so an improvement in the definition is I control a set of unspent outputs, which the amount sum to 100 hectares. So in this case, if I control all these outputs on the screen, I would have one hectare for an output two transaction A, two hectares for an output three transaction A, four hectares for an output one transaction B, nine hectares for an output one transaction C, and five hatters for output two transaction C. So I would control in this example, if I control all the, these UTXOs, I would control uh, three, seven, 16, 21 hatters. Okay, so inputs spent outputs. That's the rule. But uh, uh, it brings another question. How do you know that that input can expand the output? So here comes a new concept that uh, we already uh, uh, talked a bit about scripts. What happens is that each output has a script. What is a script? A script is like a code. It's like a function in a, in a software. Uh, this function returns just true or false. That's how it works. And the input must give some data that will go inside the function, a script evaluator will uh, uh, process that function with that input and you check the result. If the result's true, okay, that input can spend that output. It's a valid operation. If it's false, then it cannot spend. Uh, it's too, too, too generic. So let's see uh, 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 a case, it's better to understand. What happens is that, uh, uh, the, of course, there are script scripts are functions. So there are some standard scripts, so standard functions. Functions that, that are very well known, that are, very, uh, that are used everywhere. And a very well known and used function is called, it has a specific name for this pattern of script, the pay to public key hash, P2 P key H. It's everywhere in the internet. You can find it everywhere. <clears throat> Bitcoin is full of pay to pub key hash outputs. And what does it mean? And that's where uh, 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 we kind of start to understand a lot of things that are, 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 are being discussed across the internet. Because what does it mean? It means that transaction A has a script. Let's get this example. Uh, output one, has a transaction A has an output, output one. Output one has a script inside it. Uh, uh, the, the script of output one is below, right below, they are both yellow. Uh, and output one has six headers. Who can spend? Who can spend this, the six headers? Okay, what the pay to public key hash script says is that, uh, 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 Someone controls a private key from uh, uh, any digital signature scheme. It's usually elliptic curve, but it might be any other. 
From this private key, you can derive a public key, which basically, uh, uh, in this case, uh, is useful to check if the if a digital signature is valid or not. From the public key, you generate a public key hash, and that's why it's paid to public key hash. And from this public key hash, you generate two things. You generate an address. Here's there's an example. That's the address that you send to your friend. Hey, can you send me some hackers? This is my address, and then I'll send uh, uh, those hackers for you. So this address is generated out of the public key hash. It's uh, uh, like a text, ver a text version of the public key hash. It has, uh, 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 <clears throat> and it also generates the script, the pay to public key hash script. And this script is put, is inside output one with six headers. So let's say that I own the private key. So I control, I'm the owner of output one of transaction A. Okay, so those six headers, they belong to me because I control the private key. And that's where comes the phrase, not your private keys, not your tokens. It's everywhere also in the internet when you, you are researching about blockchain, Bitcoin, and this stuff. So let's say I'd like to spend this output. So those are my six hackers, and I don't know, I, I, I want to send them to, to Carlos. What do I have to do? Okay, I have to create a transaction B. This transaction B will have one input at least. This input will be spending my output number one from transaction A, so it's spending my six hackers. And how do the full nodes, how do, remember when a transaction is created after it's related to the network, the network must check if that transaction is valid. How does a full node in the peer-to-peer -peer network knows that this transaction B is allowed to spend the output one of transaction A? So what happens is that I will, I'm the owner of output one, so I will get my private key and I'll generate a signature for transaction B. Uh, 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 as I have the private key, I can do this and nobody can do this without access to this private key. So what gives me control of that output is the private key. After I generate the signature, I put the signature inside the data and this data goes inside input number one. So what happens is that the script evaluator and this script evaluator is running on each full node of the network. All of them will do the same thing. They will get the script of the output. They will get the data from the input. They will evaluate, they will run the method. They will run the pay to public key hash script and it must return true. After it returns true, it means that transaction B, input one of transaction B is valid. And they will do it for every input of every transaction. They must check whether the script of the output being spent is returning true. If any input returns false, the transaction B is not valid. It's a requirement for the validity of the transaction. That's how, <clears throat> that's how uh, uh, it works. So this pay to public key hash, it gives us a better understanding of ownership. How do I know how much Bitcoins I own? So let's explain again. If I, I, if I have 100 hackers, for example, or Bitcoins, because Bitcoins use GTXO mod, model as well. So I, if I have, I don't know, 10 Bitcoins, what does it mean? It means that uh, among a set of UTXOs, there are a subset of these UTXOs that I control. In other words, I have the private key which can make the signature to expand those outputs. And this output must be UTXOs. They must be unspent transaction outputs because the ones that were spent cannot be spent again. 
And the sum of all these UTXOs is equal to the number of tokens that I control. That's, that's how it works. And it gives us a good perspective of what a wallet is. What is a hacker wallet? What is a Bitcoin wallet? Uh, uh, <clears throat> a hacker wallet is just a manager of private keys, addresses, and UTXOs. So in this example here, what does the wallet do? The wallet must control and protect the private keys. In this example here, there are just two, but there might be infinite. There might be hundreds and hundreds of, of private keys. Each private key is directly associated with an address. And there's a path, a private key. From a private key, you can generate a public key. From the public key, you can generate an address. And then with the address, you can go, what, do the, what does the wallet do? The wallet goes and reads from the full node all UTXOs. And it checks which UTXOs belongs to them. Which UTXOs belong to that address? And then in this example here, address one, there are three UTXOs that belongs to address one. One with 10 headers, another one with 15 headers, another one with eight headers. Each of these UTXOs belongs to a transaction. It might be, I don't know, uh, 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 they might belong to the same transaction or to three different transactions. It doesn't matter, but all UTXOs belong to one transaction. Uh, uh, so in this case, I don't know, they might belong to three different transactions. It's okay. Or I don't know, the first and the second belong to the same transaction, the third to another one. Uh, 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 that's how it works. And for, for, for the private key, number two is the same. And in this example here, uh, uh, the UTXO uh, of address two, or address two has two UTXOs, one that has three headers, another one that has one header. So if I look at this wallet and that's my reality, in this world, I control, uh, let's sum up uh, 10, 25, 33, 36, 37 headers. Um, three of them, so not three, three UTXOs, that's some um, 25, uh, 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 33 headers belongs to one address and four headers belong to address number two. Marcel, may we ask questions? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Very uh, well, thank you. Thank you for thank you for giving this lecture. Uh, I, I, this question may be a bit basic, but uh, what happens if an input needs to spend only part of a UTXO? Okay, thank you. That's a great question. It's impossible. Uh, I'll show you how we handle this. It's not possible to to partially spend a UTXO. Either it's spent or not spent. There's no in between. Uh, uh, what happens, or just uh, uh, give an advance here, uh, 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 we create a change. We get a change in the transaction, but we will see more details uh, uh, in a bit. <clears throat> That's a very good question. A transact, a UT, uh, uh, an output just, have, just has uh, uh, two possible status. It's either spent, or not spent, or unspent. There is no partial spending. <clears throat> and uh, that's very important because uh, uh, this wallet here, we could be looking to just this slide, we could talk here for maybe two hours because uh, uh, that, there are a lot of interesting stuff happening here. For instance, if I gave, how, how can I prove that I control four hackers? Oh, I can share my public key number two with Carlos. So Carlos can out of this public key generate address number two. Go, Carlos goes to the blockchain, reads the UTXOs and checks, confirms that I have four headers in two UTXOs. Carlos cannot spend my money because private key number two, he doesn't have access to private key number two. 
He just knows public key number two. So that's a way that I can prove that I control, uh, 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 I control some funds. Uh, when we look at the blockchain, there will be, <clears throat> uh, uh, you can, in any blockchain, you can see how much each address controls. That's one reason, uh, uh, and a very important one, a privacy, for privacy reason, a privacy matter, in which a wallet controls multiple private keys. Uh, you see, you understand how it goes. Uh, I'll get back to the discussion a bit in a bit further, uh, 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 but this, the, those, these are very important. I mean, uh, uh, in a blockchain where the in a where a blockchain is public, in which anyone in the world can see what's happening there, privacy matters. You don't want people to know how much you control. Let's say that just here an example. If I let an exchange knows that I control address one. I mean, in that database, the exchange can have an internal database where they map. Marcelo controls address one. And they can track address one forever. And if I don't know, in the future, I have 100 Bitcoins there, they will know. They will know that that address belongs to me because it will always belongs to me now and forever. So there's a lot of privacy matters here, and there's a lot of companies providing this kind of services. That's how the police tracks, uh, 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 I don't know, robbers when they 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 steal Bitcoin from 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 people. Uh, there are some viruses for computers that are looking for private keys. When they do, they try to get the the to, to, they look for UTXOs. If they find, they spend. We'll get back to this matter because it's very important. And uh, uh, it's very important for a public network. It's different when you have a bank account that everything is fully centralized. They know how you have, how much you have. And supposedly just they know, they don't, they can't tell everyone. But here it's a public network. So if you don't, so uh, 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 what I'd like to communicate here is that UTX zone management is very important for privacy, very important, because there's no way to correlate address one and address two. You, you are the only one that knows that both addresses belongs to you. Nobody else knows. They can see individual addresses, but not set of addresses. You, the owner of the wallet, you are the only one who knows a set of addresses, but yeah. Let's move on and then we get back to this discussion. <clears throat> so, as I said before, uh, uh, a blockchain is a conflict resolution machine. So we need the definition of conflict. And it was kind of open in our last lecture, in our, in our previous lecture. And in this one, we are giving a very good definition now, a very well-defined definition. Two transactions are in conflict when they spend the same output. Remember, in a blockchain, there cannot be transactions in conflict. So no blockchain will allow transaction A or transaction B to be confirmed. It will be none of them or just one of them, but never the two of them. And that's why we say that the UTXO model solves the double spending problem. <clears throat> what is the double spending problem? So let's see it again. We discussed a bit on our previous lecture. And so let's review again. Let's review it now. A double spending problem is when, when one tries to spend the same money twice. Let's say that we, we are creating a new money, a digital money without blockchains. What would prevent people from copy and pasting or du copying the file and creating a new file and duplicating the money. Or if it's in an email, what prevents me from sending the same money for Carlos and uh, 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 I don't know, uh, uh, my dad. So in the, I don't know, in an email, I don't know the answer, but here in our world, I know the answer. What prevents me from doing this is that uh, uh, those transactions would be in conflict 
and a conflict cannot happen in a blockchain. So just one of them would be, would be confirmed and the other one would be just ignored by the network. It's a double stipending attempt and the network will forbidden this kind of operation. <clears throat> that's how, uh, 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 yeah, basically that, that's how it works. So the UTXO solves the double spending problem. Uh, uh, and to understand wh how we need to put, we need to use all the knowledge that we discussed on our uh, previous lecture and all the knowledge that we're looking now. Okay, so to illustrate, let's, let's do a full cycle so we can understand how a wallet works internally, what's happening inside the wallet, <coughs> and exactly how the UTX, UTXO model is solving the double spending problem. Uh, uh, okay, so the life of a transaction. Let's say that you have an application. So getting back to our integration, how to integrate an application with a blockchain. Let's say that you have an application and you send a, a, an order, you send a request to your wallet saying, hey, wallet, please, would you send nine headers to address X and four headers to address Y? And let's say that you have the funds, okay? If you don't have the funds, it's impossible. But let's say that you have the funds. What happens inside the wallet? So first of all, the wallet will create a new draft transaction with the two outputs. Okay, I know that you'd like to send nine headers to address X, it's an output one, and four headers to address Y, it's an output two. So what's the next step? You must have the funds to do it. How do I know if you have the funds? I need to check the UTXOs. The answer is there. So the wallet goes, the wallet has, again, a private key, a, a set of private keys for each private key, the address and the list of UTXOs uh, uh, related to that address. <clears throat> so here, uh, 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 the wallet might have chosen different sets of, of outputs, UTXOs for the inputs. For instance, uh, uh, in this example here, it got UTXO with 15 hackers. Is 15 hackers enough for this transaction? Oh yes, because I'm sending nine to address X and four to address Y. So I'm trying to send in total 13 hackers. And these balances must be uh, individually calculated for each token of the transaction. The transaction might have different tokens, so it must match four different tokens. <clears throat> so what happens is that the wallet goes there and picks this. But why this one? It's a wallet decision. And that it, it comes to a very important algorithm inside a wallet, which is the selection of inputs. If the wallet is not smart enough, it might reveal, it might reduce your privacy. Again, it's all related to privacy. <clears throat> Let's say, for instance, that uh, uh, you have a UT, UT, UTXO with uh, uh, a thousand hatters. If the wallet picks this UTXO, the, the, the ones receiving your tokens, because they know that you are the one sending, they will know that you have a thousand hatters because the wallet is revealing that that UTXO belongs to you because of this new transaction, because you're gonna sign it. And they know that you are doing this transference. I don't know if we're sending to a, an exchange, the exchange, you know how much you have, even though you haven't told them, at least for that address. So again, privacy matters, but the wallet might have chosen different, a different set. So here in this example, the wallet pick uh, two UTXOs for this. The one, the first one has 10 headers. It's in, 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 in yellow. And the other one in purple has eight headers. They sum up to 18. 
Is a team bigger than nine and four? Yes, so it's valid. I have enough funds from this too. But it could have been any different sets. It could even have a, 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 a extra. It could put, I don't know, for another two, uh, the UTX with three hatters there as well. It's okay. It could be there. As long as the sum of the inputs is bigger than the sum of the outputs, it's, it's valid. It's okay. Yeah, Marcelo. And, and this balance must happen for each different, for, for each token inside the transaction. But here, just for simplicity, we have just headers. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, good class as well. Uh, one question, uh, what does make the decision? What is the point of decision to define if the inputs will go through the 15 block? I mean, there's 15 entering or if you go through the 10 plus the eight? Yeah, that's okay. a good question. It, it, it depends on the, on, the, on the policy of selection. And there are different policies for different wallets. I'd say that an advanced user, uh, uh, you can choose, you can manually say, hey, wallet, please use these inputs for me. Uh, that's a, a very, very, very advanced user. Uh, uh, for basic users, they usually they just rely on the on the on the default policy of the wallets. There are many different policies. Uh, uh, a common policy is that uh, uh, get from the highest amount that you have to the lowest until it goes above the number of tokens you'd like to send. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's not good policy because let's say that you have uh, a thousand hatters, you're going to get a thousand hatters here first. And it's not a good choice because you have 15. So you can have more advanced policies. And again, why does it matter? For privacy, because it's a public network. After mm -hmm. you make the transfers, they will know that that address belongs to you and they will track down that address. And that's a reason, because many people, they have this question. Oh, my wallet keeps generating new addresses for me all the time. Why is that? For privacy reasons. Your wallet is spreading your funds, your tokens, among a lot of UTXOs. So people have a hard time tracking how much you have. And by people, I mean anyone looking at the blockchain. But mainly the people that knows who you are. So I don't know, you enter in a store and you buy using a blockchain and you make a payment using a blockchain. Now they know that ad that address or that set of addresses belong to you. They can track that address down. And there are companies tracking addresses all along. There are a lot of uh, uh, a, 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 a ban list of addresses for different networks that the police is tracking down because they know that there are problems with those addresses and so on. So everyone in this new world for privacy matters would like to control and take care of their UTXOs. But let's, let's move forward. Our transaction is not ready yet. Our wallet is sending, so let's move forward. Uh, but did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next point is, okay, so I put 10 plus eight, I put 18 hatters there. And I, I'm sending just 13. I have, uh, 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 I'm kind of, there's extra five hatters there. So what happens? Okay, as I cannot partially spend an output, they will be fully spent. I create a new one with a change. I get five hatters back to me. Which address am I going to use on this change? An address that belongs to my wallet. See, I can put here, I don't know, the address that, that the address one, let me just get back one slide. I could use address one, I could use address two. But then I would be revealing to the world that I'm sending 13 hackers and I'm getting, I'm getting uh, uh, five back as a change. So what 
most wallets do usually, they generate a new address, so a new private key. So nobody knows how much headers I'm sending actually. Because they don't know that, that this one is a change address. I know, but they don't. It's not a public information. Uh, and that's why most of the explorers, we'll talk about explorers in a bit, but there are a lot of public explorers in the, in, in, in the web uh, for blockchains. Uh, they usually, they try to estimate how much is being transferred, but they don't know. If the transaction is properly curated, they, they, they don't have a way to know. They can't track down. But yeah, if you use the same address or any previous address that you have already used, they can track down and they know, okay. Uh, 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 and they also, they, they follow the inputs and they try to figure out uh, 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 what addresses belongs to the same person, belong to the same person. Okay, so now it created the change address. Now this wallet is, this, this transaction is balanced. We have an input 18 headers, and on outputs, 18 hackers. That's a situation, Hector has no fees. So the outputs equals the inputs. But Bitcoin, for instance, they charge fees. As they charge fees, the outputs must be a little bit smaller than in the inputs. And this difference is the fee. But yeah, here we're, we're, we're looking generically uh, and in Hector, they must just be equal, must be balanced. And if you're having multiple tokens, it must be balanced for all tokens involved. That's how, <clears throat> that's how it works. So the next step inside the wallet is, okay, we need to sign the inputs. Remember, I cannot spend that, those two outputs if I don't sign them. In this example here, I'm assuming that we are using the script, the pay to public key hash script, the one that we saw before. Uh, if you are using different scripts, you have to solve the script. There are different scripts, okay? Uh, 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 but yeah, I guess I'm a, uh, if you have time, we can cover them here, but I'm afraid that we have a lot of other topics to discuss. We won't have time to this. But yeah, I'll, I'll try. And I'm explaining all of this because uh, uh, this kind of knowledge is essential for integrating an application with a blockchain. <clears throat> so I'm trying to focus on that, on that uh, uh, go. So you have a better understanding of how you can integrate your applications with a blockchain. <clears throat> so how does it sign? It gets the private key, generate the signature, put, put in the form of data inside the input. And now that the signature is inside input one, and the different signature, the signatures are different, okay? Sorry, they have the same name here, but they're different. Uh, uh, input, two, input two has a different data that has the, the second signature. And now that transaction is ready. It has all pieces of information that it needs. It proves that I control both inputs because it has the signatures. And every full node in the network can check. That's essential, remember? The network is decentralized. There's no central point of operation. Each full node has to verify everything. And that's how they verify ownership. And now that the transaction is ready, we are ready to push the transaction to the network. <clears throat> so that's the final transaction. For example, I'm sending nine headers for address X, four headers to address Y, getting five headers in change for me, as change for me. And I have two inputs, one with 10 headers and another one with eight headers. And this, their signatures are inside the data. And now this transaction is completed. So I push the transaction to my full node. My full node relays to their, to their peers. And the peers relate to their peers and so on until it reaches all the network. But it, it hasn't ended yet. On the wallet side, it's kind of ended, but not from the perspective of the transaction. Now the transaction has been relayed to the network. And the network has a copy of this transaction. So the transaction lies on the mempool of every full node that's connected to the network. I can't say every full node because 
Each full node can have their own policies. So they can discard this transaction if they want, but let's say that it is. Usually it is. So the transaction is there and what happens? A miner will be mining as we saw in our last meeting, in our last lecture. So miners will create a block template with that transaction inside. After a while, a transaction will be mined and will be, and the transaction is finally confirmed by a block. Here, the transaction is in yellow, and that's how, uh, uh, that's the end of the life of a transaction. After the transaction is confirmed by a block, those inputs, they point to outputs. Those outputs are spent now. They're not unspent. And the new outputs in town are the new outputs that I just created. So what, uh, in another perspective, what does a transaction do? It spends inputs and creates new unspent outputs. It destroys outputs and creates new unspent outputs. That's what a transaction do, a transaction does. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's how, how it works. Let me, so before moving, uh, I'd like just to confirm, uh, to check if you have any questions. I saw two questions on the, <clears throat> on the chat. <clears throat> First question is how to mine Hetero and BTC at the same time? Uh, yeah, I, I won't cover in this uh, uh, conversation now the merged mining approach, but yeah, you can you can mine both at the same time without any loss of performance using a technique called merged mining. We have a, a, a technical uh, a document explaining how it works, and but we have software developed. You just have to use our software. Uh, just uh, uh, send me an email. I'll show my email here again, and I'll help you to to do to do this, to get it done. Uh, you, you asked that, can it be done in a low consumption device? Uh, yes, I mean, you can you can do it using any mining device that works for Bitcoin or just for Hathor, as you wish. Uh, uh, but yeah, you, you have to check whether it's profitable or not. Usually that's the, this, the miner's decision is related to, to being profitable or not. So the number of hashes per second the number of hashes per kilowatt hour that your device can can do. Usually that how, that's how it goes. And the other question is about uh, a project being developed in DeFi, uh, but there's no question really. There's just a description. Uh, uh, you can you can I don't know read the question there or or just talk here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, Marcel. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> to be sure we, we were talking with Carlos, uh, and I saw in your in your website uh, that you guys are you know fostering or incentivizing um, more newcomers, of course, for the ecosystem. So uh, perhaps for the for the end of the conversation, because it's not that technical, it's more you know in regards of the business. Uh, what what is your like? Grants program or accompaniment program? Or are you planning to launch hackathons or, or any sorts of, of, yeah, like events that we can participate as a development team, as I mentioned? Okay, yeah, uh, yes, you do. And we also have some grant programs. Uh, I don't know the details of them, but yeah, I can put in place with uh, who knows and uh, help you go through it. So my pleasure to help you. Uh, just send me an email and uh, uh, yeah, we can we can chat. Yeah, we can make a, a, a separate a separate meeting just to discuss this. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other question? Okay. So <clears throat> okay. So we just saw how the UTXO model works. Again, uh, uh, the, the, there are other models for blockchains, but the UTXO, uh, uh, wow, just showed the message here that you can see my screen now. Are, are you seeing my screen? Okay, perfect. So there are others. This one is the, the one that was created by Bitcoin 
It's very well known. It's also used by Hetero. But for instance, Ethereum is a different animal. They use a very different approach, the account model. Uh, uh, but yeah, I won't have the time to discuss it here. We would spend the next one hour discussing it and uh, we must go through how to build your, how to integrate your application with, with a blockchain. We, we, we will go back to this discussion and that's why we have this slide again. It's showing up ever uh, again and again because that's the focus of our, of our conversation. I'd like to give you a better understanding of how to do this. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so let's, now that we understand how a blockchain works and we have a better understanding of how transactions works in the UTXO model, which is basically now the model used by Hathor, uh, uh, I'd like to, to, to go through other points that are relevant for an integration. And uh, uh, so now that's our updated diagram. We have a full node that we can run. We have miners that are connected to the full node and mining new blocks. So we understand how this ecosystem works. You can mine as well if you want, that's a different thing. Uh, and your, depending on how you build your, your use case, you might have to mine or not. It depends a lot, usually not. Usually you don't have to mine, okay? So you understand what is a wallet and how to handle, how to work with a wallet. And uh, 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 it's funny because now that you, you understand how wallet works, you understand why a wallet gets slow. The more UTXO the wallet has to, to manage, the slower it gets. It has to download all the UTXOs, it has to manage and everything. And uh, depending, if you're a miner, you might have a wallet with a million with hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of UTXOs. So it might get slow depending uh, on, on, your, on your specific wallet. But yeah, you have the wallets, you can communicate with wallets. And uh, uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about it, but yeah, we have a wallet that you can just run and control it through an ATCP interface, API. And uh, you just say, oh, please send. And it does everything that you just saw uh, automatically for you. So you don't have to do it manually. And also another tool that's very relevant and very used is the Explorer. What is the Explorer? The Explorer is connected to a full node and it gives you a web view of the blockchain. You can see the blocks, the transactions, the mempool, depends on, the, on the, what the Explorer would like to show you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so you can see different things from the blockchain. And usually that's how people do. Uh, uh, I don't know, you asked me for one header, I send it to you and I send you the transaction ID uh, uh, with a link of an explorer. So you can go from your cell phone and take a look there. So you don't have to connect the blockchain, but it, and it's very important from the perspective <clears throat> of, uh, 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 of an, uh, an integration, an application uh, uh, integrated with blockchain that the explorer, when you open an explorer in your browser, uh, you are trusting into this explorer. This explorer can change data. The only piece, piece of data that is immutable is inside the blockchain. No other piece of data is immutable. So <clears throat> when you look at an explorer, you are trusting the explorer. And if you run your own explorer, you can always connect to a public full node. And if you do this, you are trusting the public full node because the public full nodes can also not give you uh, uh, right information. They can change the information. If the, the full node is modified, you never know whether the code is modified or not. So it's very important from the perspective of the application who you trust. Usually what do uh, uh, most of the applications do? They run their own stack. They run their own full nodes. They run their own explorer. They run their own wallet. That's what uh, uh, exchanges do that what uh, uh, projects using there are so many different uh, uh, projects for payments and for uh, marketplaces etc they run their own stack and uh, I cannot emphasize it more do not trust you don't have to trust and don't do this you don't have to trust third parties just run your stack and verify and when someone sends you an uh, uh, a transaction and sends you the link of a, an explorer, 
make sure that it's an explorer that you can trust. If not, it can show you fake information. And a lot of people have been scammed like this before. As you can see, there's a lot of, uh, 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 we can have a whole conversation, two hour conversations just about the tax. How people scam people uh, uh, in the internet using this technology. Because they say that blockchain is very safe and blockchain is the solution for many problems. And it is indeed, but the blockchain, usually you're not seeing the blockchain, you're seeing something else, you're seeing the explorer. And you trust that it, it, it's related to the blockchain, but it might not be. And that's where problems happen usually. Okay, <clears throat> so moving forward, the next, uh, let me just keep control of time. Okay, we have 40 minutes. <clears throat> uh, uh, another important question is how do I store data in a blockchain? I just show you the UTXO model. Sorry. And now the next question is, how, how, how do I start data there? And the answer again is it depends. It depends on the type of data. It depends on your application. It depends on a lot of stuff. So I'll give you some examples here and let's explore and let's try to understand <clears throat> how it works. Uh, uh, so if you'd like to create a token, let's say that you'd like to create a stable coin. And then you create your token, it's a stable coin. The blockchain is the ledger. You don't have to do anything else with your application. Every transaction will be stored in the blockchain. You have the history of transfers. Uh, 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 everything will be there. If you mint new tokens, everyone you know, because it will be on the ledger that's in the blockchain. So basically, if you create a token, uh, uh, the blockchain stores all pieces of information regarding ownership, etc. Oh, your token is special. There are some things that I'd like to store there. Is it possible? Oh, yes, it is. I'll show you an example here. Uh, uh, another kind of example is that, okay, I have a document. And in your case, you have to store biometric information inside the blockchain. How can I do this? Let's say the biometric information is a document, is a piece of document. Uh, so usually how it works, the blockchain must uh, store the information in this distributed platform. So usually it's expensive uh, uh, because there's a lot of storage requirements to store a lot of data. So usually how it's done, at your document, we will see here in more details. And you store on blockchain a fingerprint of the data, of the document. Not the document itself, but a fingerprint of it. So that's very important for, uh, Marcel, just a quick comment. Sorry about that. Sure. So that's, no, no, that's go ahead. very important for the, the final task. We, you will be storing on the blockchain the fingerprint of the biometric information. We will explain you how you will not be storing the full information. That's that's a trickery, but it's it's very smart, very simple, but uh, that's key. That's a key, uh, a, a key uh, decision to make the usage of the blockchain really cheap, okay? Yeah, you, you, it's totally correct. Sorry about uh, that. Uh, yeah, no, to... no, no, it's, it's okay. It's very important to make these comments. Uh, uh, it's true, and it's important to understand what the fingerprint gives you. So it gives you proof of existence. So I don't know, uh, of course, for your work, for your final job, uh, uh, you, you have to deliver a system with biometric data. But I don't know, what about the notary system? Proof of system, what about an IP, an intellectual property a thing that you wanna prove that you, prove someone that you had that, that idea or you wrote that, that that day. So when you write a fingerprint to the blockchain, you have proof of existence. You can prove that uh, it existed at that time. You have, there's a timestamp. So you can prove that it existed at that time, that day. So two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Uh, uh, and you, it's also tamper proof. So you can prove that you have not changed the documents. 
that the document that we're showing right now is exactly the same that you restore the fingerprint in the blockchain, I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and so on. Not more than 10 years ago, because Bitcoin is not that old. Okay, Bitcoin is only uh, uh, 12 years old, so it's impossible to do something <laughs> before Bitcoin in this sense, but yeah, uh, 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 it's tamper-proof. So let's, let's see how it works in more detail. <clears throat> so what, we do, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna store the documents off-chain and the fingerprints on-chain. And where, where where do the fingerprints go? I have the transactions, I have input, I have outputs. Where do they go? And uh, 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 the answer is simple again. They go inside the script. Instead of using a pay to public key hash script, you're going to use a different script, a data script, where you put some data there, and that output cannot be spent ever. It will be an unspent output forever or not depends on what you want it might be spent or not it depends on your structure on, on your case usually they're not <clears throat> and i'll show you some examples here uh, uh, so what happens what's the flow usually you have the data you calculate the fingerprint in this example here i used i used a hash function but there are different ways to calculate di to digest your data Hash function is a way to go, but there are different ways to do this. And this will generate an ID. It's important that this ID, uh, uh, that's why I use it, a hash function here, is related to your data. And if your data changes, the ID changes. This kind of relation is very important. And then you get this ID, you put inside this script, a data script. You get this script and you put inside the out. And this output is inside the transaction. At the same time, you get the data and you store the data in an offline, off-chain storage. Uh, an off-chain storage just means that it's not in blockchain. It doesn't mean that it has to be on your computer. It might be, it's okay. You can use your local file system, but you can use cloud storage. I don't know if you're are used to AWS services. You can use S3 in AWS. Uh, uh, there are other cloud storage services everywhere. You can put it, uh, uh, I don't know, Dropbox, your Google Drive, uh, uh, wh wh whatever you want. Uh, you can use IPFS. And that's what we did on our last lecture uh, we, when we created the, the NFT. I'll, I'll show the NFT again for you. And we'll see everything that we're talking here happening in the NFT. Everything that's here we see in a real world example. So you can use an IPFS. IPFS is like a file system, a peer-to-peer -peer network for its interplanetary file system. Basically a public network where you can connect and you can distribute your files there. Uh, uh, it's for, for storage. You can put in a torrent. It's okay. It's your file. You can put, you can keep it private. You can make it public whatever you, you want. What is important here is that it's off-chain. It's not me offline, off-chain, just not in the blockchain. And the fingerprints are in the blockchain. You can even create a permission network to share this offline, this, this off-chain storage. And if we, uh, 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 we won't cover it here, but if you go through this permission network for off-chain storage, we would, uh, uh, find what uh, uh, we call hybrid solutions, where you have things working in blockchains and in permission networks at the same time. In Hector, we call it Cybex, but different networks will give different names for this. Uh, uh, but yeah, you can use any, any kind of storage for you. here. And again, the fingerprints, they go to the outputs. So the next question is, how can I audit this information? And an auditor, how, what, what, what does an auditor need to do the auditing? So the auditor needs access to your off-chain storage to get the data so they can calculate the hash. 
So you need to tell the auditor, here's my data, that's my hash function, or that's my fingerprint, that's the fingerprint algorithm I used. So they can get the data and calculate the ID. They won't trust, they cannot trust the ID you give to him, you give to him, to them. They must calculate themselves. And then you also give them the transaction in the blockchain, the transaction ID. So it goes to the full nodes, it reads, it gets the transaction, it looks into the output. So you don't say the transaction, you say the output, which is, uh, 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 which is basically a pair, a pair of information, the transaction ID and the index, the number of the output, output one, output two, and so on. So from the output, they get the script. From the script, they get the on-chain ID. That's the ID that is recorded on chain inside the transaction. From the transaction, they can also know the timestamp, when it was recorded there. So they know that it happened two years ago, one year ago, six months ago. You cannot fake it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you cannot, there, there's, there's no way to fake it. In fact, what happens in the blockchain is that uh, uh, the transaction is confirmed when a block is found. So there's no exact precision. We cannot say that it happened on January 5th uh, uh, at 7.30, 22 seconds. But you can say that it happens on January 5th at 12, between 12.30 and 12.40 or 12.30 and 12.45. Each network will have a different range, a different precision, but it's, it's, it's very good for most of the cases. This kind of thing is, is, is well enough, usually. So and then the auditor will- Marcel, just let me, because this is really relevant for, for them. So just to make a quick comment. So at the end of the day, you will be storing, for example, Carlos got inside the building at 8.30 a.m and Carlos is Carlos with 83.76%. And you store it wherever, whenever, whatever you want in a, in a database, in, in a file, in, 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 on, on, in Google Drive, you just save it, whatever you want. And then you create, for example, a hash of that information and that hash goes to the blockchain. So the hash stays on the blockchain. That's a very cheap process. Okay, good. Then there is a problem and there is an auditing firm coming and checking if that information is true, what they will do. You give them the information you store in, in your Google Drive, for example, and then they will go over the same hash process and they will compare with the hash that was stored in, 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 in the blockchain. If the information is exactly the same, the hatches will match. Otherwise, if we change from 8.30 to 9.30, the time Carlos got inside the building, of course, the hatch will be totally different and they will see, look, there is something wrong there. So that's the key point. Is that clear? So when we're storing this, like the blockchain is horrible like a record of all the transactions being entering the building. Yeah. In this case. Okay. Will be the storage of the hash of these transactions. So we can always add it and confirm it, but you don't store the full information like the time, the, 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 the probability that Carlos is Carlos and so on. So that will stay on your, uh, on your file. You can save it in your own database. You can save it on Google Drive you know, on whatever you know, data structure you want to save it. That's up to you. But what goes to the blockchain, it's a very light, light information, which is the hash, sort of the compression of the full information that goes to the blockchain. And uh, an audit company can check if you are cheating or not because they will compare the hatches, for example, okay? So that's the way to make it very cheap, very easy to audit and to confirm that the information is trustable, okay? Sorry again, Marcelo. No, 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 sorry, it's okay. 
it's 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 perfect. Uh, and just to 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 add to to what you said, <clears throat> in the information that you're storing off chain, you can save the kind the the what hash or digest algorithm used for fingerprinting. So you can change it later if you need. Let's say that, I don't know, you've been using SHA and SHA is not safe anymore. Uh, so you wanna change it to a different structure so you can evolve. You can save that the timestamp, the precise time. So it was 7.30, 20 seconds and those milliseconds, it's okay. And the auditor, they can check that the that time is reasonable according to the to record the time in the blockchain. <clears throat> they can do this as well, okay? So uh, 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 on the off-chain structure, you decide uh, whatever you put inside the hash will be aud audible. It, whatever information you put outside the hash, it's not audible. The author cannot trust exactly on you. Okay, and at the end of the day, after you save to the blockchain, it's good to save the transaction ID as well. That's the transaction ID. It's just like the, the stamp ID of your data. So the auditor needs it as well uh, uh, in order to check. Make sense? Yes, it does okay. make sense. <clears throat> so, Let's continue, there, there's more to discuss. Uh, so here is just an example, because here, in this example here, I'm saying that you, you are just storing your data, but you can do both. And that's exactly what an NFT is. On an NFT, we are storing a file option, and we are at the same time creating a token that shows ownership of that, that document or that NFT or whatever it means. The, the meaning of the token, we give the meaning. The blockchain doesn't know about it. What the blockchain knows is that they are related. <clears throat> so on our last lecture, we created an NFT. What happened? I took a screenshot of us. So I got a file, an image file. That's the file here. I went to the IPFS network and I uploaded there. Uh, usually I need to run an IPFS full node because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network as well. Not a blockchain, but a different one. <clears throat> I didn't have to do this because I used a service that does it for me. And they allow me to upload some free data there. Uh, uh, and that's what I did. I used Pinata at the time and they, they are running the full node for me. So I'm trusting them. Uh, 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 I could have run my own, and so I didn't have to trust them. But in this case, I was, it's just an example. Uh, and then uh, IPFS gave me an ID. It's nice because IPFS doesn't use a hash directly on the file. They have their own way of generating the ID. It's also, it has all the, the, the features that we discussed before. It's like a hash, but it's a bit different. <clears throat> so, okay, I got the ID, I put inside the script. And I sent it to a special transaction in a hetero network called a create token transaction. And I said, okay, on output one, I'm putting the ID. And in a different output, I'm creating 100 Bitcoin class MIT token, tokens. And those were the tokens I sent to. <clears throat> After I created this transaction, I could spend output two because it was in an address that belongs, belongs to my wallet. See, that, that, that's how it works. And here, I have here the link, and I'd like to take a look at our public explorer. So right now we are trusting the explorer because we're not looking directly to the blockchain, we're trusting the explorer. It's very important to emphasize these things, to understand what we're doing. The Explorer is showing us an image. That was the image that we, we saw there. Can we trust this image? I'm not sure. I mean, this Explorer is developed by, by my company, so I trust it. But you don't have to trust me. That's important. It's a zero trust system. <clears throat> so uh, uh, here we have an overview of the token. What, happened, what matters here for us is this transaction. 
that's the, can you read or should I increase the font size? Maybe, is this better? Here, it's a create token transaction. Okay, it has some out, it has inputs and outputs, just like we said. The first output has the data. Uh, forget about this enable to the code. It's something that's going, it's, it's going to be fixed next week. So that's the piece of data that we just registered there. This piece of information we got from the IPFS network. That's why we have the IPFS here. We have other outputs. We have here the 100 tokens that I created. See, it's a paid to public key hash. It's right here. That's the format of the script. And that's my address. That this address belongs to my wallet. Don't track it down, please. It's, it's, it's open, it's on the internet. <coughs> so uh, uh, I also had uh, Hatter charges uh, uh, a fee to create a token. So that's what happened here. There's an input. So this address belongs to me as well. As you can see, my wallet had to sign it in order to spend this output. And what output was? It was from this transaction, output number one. That's the UTXO that was spent by this input. And this guy had 4.96 hackers. Why did I say had? Because now it's spent. I cannot spend it anymore, right? It's, it's not, an, uh, but this one here, and then on the output, I have 4.94 headers. This is my change address. Look at this. All things are, are, are appearing here. I'm telling you because I know that because I did it. So I know that it's my changing address. And uh, uh, there's a difference. There's a two cents difference. What happened with these two cents? Oh, that's the price that the network charged to create this token. Okay, uh, 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 I also created an, another output that's a melt authority. I'll leave it for another, another moment. We don't have time here. We have more, 20 more minutes only. Then there's a lot, a lot of things to cover. And here, so I related this document to this token. After that, uh, let me just show this for you. Let's get this ID from the IPFS network. And let's use an IPFS public explorer. And let's see if the image is correct. Uh, is the internet working? Oh. Hey, IPFS. Okay, it's a public explorer, so sometimes, okay, loading. It's still loading, it's slow. Uh, but yeah, it seems that that's the right image. Again, I'm using a public explorer from IPFS. It's not a blockchain, but it's similar. Uh, uh, so I'm trusting them. The best way to check would be to run my own nodes of the IPFS network and download this image from there. But okay, it's enough for now. And this here, 100 tokens, you sent me your addresses. So I sent them for you. See, uh, I sent for someone during the class. The input has 100. BCM, and the output has one for the one I sent. And what is this? That's my change, because I cannot partially spend this. So after you sent me a bunch of addresses, so I did it again. See that's spent? This is a UTX, an UTXO. That's unspent, because there's no spent mark here. And I'm just trusting the Explorer. And if I click on this spent, I go to the next transaction. It has the 99 BCM as input. And then I sent to several addresses. See, multiple outputs in one transaction. And you received. Oh, and here is my change. See? <clears throat> but okay, let's go back to the presentation just to show you it working on practice. It's, it's really interesting to see it working. Uh, let's get back here. To not this, but this presentation. Can you see the presentation again? Yes. Okay, so let's let's go. Let's move forward. 
Okay, you can store a single document there, but you don't have to. I don't know, uh, here it's just one idea. There are several that you can use. Uh, uh, for instance, you can use a Merkle tree. Uh, I won't cover exactly how it works here. We don't have the time to do this, but you can easily find material about it on the internet. But it basically means that you can use, you can put several documents and generate one single fingerprint for all of them, which is the top, which is the, the, the top of the tree. So that's the, the dot that's connected to the script. And you write that, that guy to your transaction. And then you can individually send a file data tree to the auditor and the auditor is able to, to check that the, da the data tree has not changed. So let's say you have biometric data and uh, uh, you have several people accessing. So if you, you can do this, instead of generating multiple transactions, you can just uh, generate a huge Merkle tree, a big with many files and just store the roots of the Merkle tree. And then the auditor can check each so, one individually. Just a quick comment, Marcel. So what Marcel is saying, it's like instead of store, when Carlos gets in and then when uh, Paul gets in and when uh, Joanna gets in and so on and so forth, you can put all these transactions, you can aggregate all these things and save as only one hatch on the uh, on the on the blockchain so that's a process like to compress all the information and make it cheaper to save on the blockchain okay does it make sense so you can do it individually or you can aggregate data to put a larger amount of data and somehow save money on the usage of the the blockchain just one thing to add, <clears throat> you can say, okay, I could zip a file and save the file. What's the difference? Uh, and the difference here is that if you zip a file, if an auditor requests information about John and you have John and Mark in the same file, you have to release Mark information to the auditor as well. But it, you, don't, you don't want to. So if you use a, Mark, a Merkle tree, you can release uh, separately each piece of data, each leaf of the tree, you can release individually to the auditor. Only the mark information the auditor can do the auditing in a okay. safe way. That's, okay. that's the benefit of using a Merkle tree instead of a zip file or I don't know, a tar file, something like this. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, there are other stuff. Uh, 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 one thing that I like to use for moving files, for moving things, like just like a database that you are constantly updating uh, is a DAG structure. Uh, uh, but yeah, we, we don't have the time here to discuss it. Uh, uh, I'd like to discuss other stuff with you. So uh, you can email me and I can send you uh, uh, explanations after, or I can, I can share some, some slides with you after and you can take a look. And if you have some questions, you can, you can send to me, okay? Sorry about that. There, here you can be creative, okay? The two is you can put something in the outputs, whatever you want. And there are many different data structures that you can use and you can be creative in the best way to do this. I'm just showing things that are very common. Just one file, just like in the NFT. In this case, we are also creating a token. You can create a token if it makes sense for you. Uh, uh, and here, uh, uh, a Merkle tree, okay? Move your head. <clears throat> here, I put here, I'll share these slides with you. Just for you to know, there are some steps that you can use to create a proof of, state, a proof of concept integration. So it might help. Uh, uh, one is that you can use Hetero Testnet instead of the mainnet. The mainnet is the one that is for real. And the testnet, the, the tokens there are, are worth zero, worth zero. So it's free for you. And if you need tokens for the testnet, just email me, send me your address, I'll send you some tokens. It's just for tests. Uh, it's very easy to mine on testnet. If you like to mine as well, you mine, you get your tokens, your reward, mining rewards. And because the hash rates in the, in the, in the testnet is really low. Nobody wants to spend energy in a testnet. That's the point. Yeah. So you, you can, you can, there are different ways to go. In Hatter, we have a Hatter wallet headless, which is a wallet that is fully controlled by an HTTP API. That's perfect for integration. You have your software, 
You send a message to the wallet, the wallet executes whatever you want. Uh, 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 so you can just install and use it. Uh, uh, we have a Docker image with it, so you can just run from our Docker image and the wallet will work. But the wallet needs a full node. Okay. And then you can run your own full node. Again, there's a, heter uh, uh, a Docker image for Hetercore. Uh, uh, I can send you the details of how you can run on your computer or on a, on a server. But in this case, as it's just, uh, it's not a, a real world application, uh, uh, you can use our public nodes if you want. Here's yes. an address of one of them. You can trust them, it's okay. We're, we, we're not tampering you. We're not tampering your data, okay? You can trust us. But yeah, it's, it's up to you. If you'd like to run your full nodes, uh, uh, do it. it it's, it's a good experience. It depends on how, how much time you have available for to develop your, 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 your case. And basically your application will consume the TCP API from both the full node and the wallet. For some things you request from the full nodes, for other things you request from the wallet and so on and so forth. Uh, there's API to write, API to read, and uh, uh, that's basically how, how you're gonna do. So I, 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 I almost put here an architecture diagram, but it depends on how you wanna do this. So it's up to you. If you want my help, I'm open to discuss with you good architectures, just send me an email and I'll help you uh, uh, in this discussion, but it depends a lot on what you're doing or, or, and what exactly, what features you'd like to have in your application, okay? Thank you. Sure, so moving forward, the next obvious question, and that's a very hot topic in the blockchain world, is how many operations per second can this network do? If it's a database, how many queries can I send to the database per second? How much does it cost? Uh, we have kind of 10 minutes here. <clears throat> uh, 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 I'll try to, to not go over the, the, the time here, but uh, uh, that's another topic that we could be here forever discussing. It's a very interesting topic and a very controversial topic. And the first thing to discuss here that I like to bring to you is that there's a dilemma here of throughput versus decentralization. Why? And uh, uh, the, the, I'd like to discuss, uh, the point here is that there's no right answer. It depends. It depends on what features you want for your application, what features you care most, uh, uh, and so on. So it depends a lot on what you're looking for. But usually, uh, uh, for a blockchain network, we're looking for a global network. So if you are testing your throughput using two full nodes in a low latency environment, maybe it's not very a very good test. Yeah. Uh, uh, it depends. You can say, no, for my application, it's exactly what I want. And I'd say, okay, it's your application, it's not mine. But for blockchain, just like Bitcoin, just like Hector, usually you'd like to have it working on a global network, which basically means that anyone in the world can run their full nodes. It's not a local thing. It's not a local network. It's a global network. Usually another thing that's important is equality between peers. I'll discuss it further, why it matters. Uh, uh, but usually on a blockchain, you don't wanna have special peers validators and those kind of stuff. I'll discuss it further. <clears throat> and the last point here is what are the minimum requirements for your full node? And all these things, they are a trade-off between throughput, which is number of transactions per second or queries per second or whatever, and a decentralization, the decentralization of the network. When you see there, oh, uh, I'll talk a bit about this. Uh, I don't know, Solana can reach 50,000 transactions per second. How can they do this? They're viol violating some of these rules. And then it's your call to decide, do I care? Do their violation matter for me or don't they? Or they don't. So it's up to you, to your application, to your case. 
Okay, and that that's a bit of what what, what I'd like to to discuss here. Again, there's no right answer. Uh, what does a global network mean? It means that there will be peers everywhere. And there will be cluster of peers. Some peers will be close together, so they will have low latency, but some peers will be far away, so they will have high latency. Bandwidth it might be a concern in a global network. Some peers might have a very low bandwidth. I don't know, it's hard to have a, a, a large bandwidth between the United States and Asia because it's expensive. That's the reason. <clears throat> Usually many networks that they, they, they release uh, uh, high throughputs, they're violating this. They are running all full nodes in a very, in a local and low latency environment. And latency has a huge impact on throughput. I don't know how used you are with distributed database, not blockchain, just like a cluster of Oracle, a cluster of MySQL, etc. Usually they run in a very low latency environment. If you put them in a high latency environment, they don't work very well. They have a lot of issues. Okay, so that's one thing that increases uh, 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 <clears throat> the throughput. And why does it affect centralization? Because I don't know, you have to put just people from the United States or from the East Coast can do it, can, can connect to this network. Or just people from the Asia, some countries in the Asia, I don't know, China or, or so uh, it might be a problem. It depends. It depends on the blockchain. It depends on what you're building. Uh, another thing that's, that comes with this same image here for a discussion is about the equality between peers. What some networks do is that let's create what they call validators. Solana does that. Uh, 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 what, what are validators? They are kind of special full nodes that validates and signs and everyone trusts them. Uh, usually they are, uh, 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 it's not free. You cannot just connect. You have to ask permission to be a validator. And why is it bad to have validators? Uh, first of all, you have to trust them. And second, uh, uh, so it kind of breaks the zero trust system because there are special nodes in the network. And uh, second of all, I don't know where the validators are running, but if they're a validator, uh, uh, that two nodes, somebody owns or an individual or a company, uh, 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 someone know, owns that two nodes. And I don't know, they can get some order to shut them down or to change something. Yeah. As happens, EOS had this problem before. They got court orders to undo transactions and it completely violates the network. Again, it's not a problem. It depends on what you're looking for, for your application. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, uh, <clears throat> again, it depends. It's always a trade-off. Another point here is the minimum requirements for the full node. I mean, I, I put here some examples just for discussion, but let's say that using a very simple computer, that you can rent for $60 a month, you, you, you can process 800 transactions per second. But if you get a better computer, more CPU, more RAM, more memory, more bandwidth, it, then it costs $600 per month. Uh, as the price grows, less people have access to it. And then it's more centralized. I don't know, let's say that you go to a cluster that costs six, sixty thousand dollars per month. How many people can pay for it? Maybe just a few. So usually there will be companies, but not all companies can spend that amount of money. Again, it depends. The environment affects the number of transactions per second that the phone node can process. The more CPU, the more run, the more there are some, some networks that require two GPUs. For instance, <clears throat> and I, I'm here, to, I'm, I, 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 I don't have many time, <clears throat> but it's funny because Solana has been advertising a lot about 50,000 transactions per second. And if you take a look at what they did is that they were running in a low latency environment. 
uh, 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 one computer next to the other, to the other with a cable. And they were using a very expensive machine. They were using two high-end GPUs to process the transactions. So uh, yeah, okay. I mean, it's okay. If Visa can do this as well. PayPal can do this as well. There are a lot of distributed systems. Distributed systems. There are a lot of scaling systems that can process a high, extremely high number of transactions per second. All the financial sector can process maybe millions of transactions per second. NASDAQ, all those guys. I don't know how what Solana is doing or other blockchains are doing, how they are different. They are building high-end machines, very expensive machines that I cannot have at my place. So it affects decentralization. So again, there's no right answer. Maybe it's good for your application, maybe it's not. So, but it's important to understand how these things affect throughput. Because uh, 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 that, that's a very, very high topic. And that's a very good debate uh, uh, about it in the internet. Uh, and besides these aspects, there's also an architecture thing that I'd like to discuss, but I, I'm almost time out, so I'll go. I'll go quick, and then I'll open for questions, and then I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll end the lecture, and we can stay here discussing things. <clears throat> uh, uh, what happens is that Bitcoin and Ethereum, they put transactions inside the blocks, and they do it using Merkle trees. The same Merkle trees I just suggested for you. Uh, 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 and when they do this, the blocks can grow a lot. So they put a maximum block size. There's a maximum number of transactions that you can put in each block. And this leads to an architecture problem. And the best way to show it is through an analogy, but we'll discuss it a bit. Can you see the video? I don't know yeah. if it's working. Yes, we can see. The it's a train station. It's a train station. And what happens is that, let's imagine that each person in the, in the train station uh, is a transaction. So as new people arrive, it's just like new transactions arriving in the network. And the train, the trains are the blocks. So every once in a while, depending on the DAA, the, the difficulty adjustment, adjustment algorithm that we discussed on our previous class, uh, uh, there's a rate of trains arriving. Each time a trains arrive, people goes inside, people go inside. But at some point the trains get full. And after the trains full, all other people have to wait outside for the next train. And it puts a limitation, architectural limitation to the throughput of the train station. Because if there are more people arriving than people fits on the trains, the line, the queue, the line for the train will, be, will grow infinitely. It will never stop growing because there's a, an architecture limitation for this structure. Does this make sense? Totally makes sense. Can, can you see it? And that's a big problem. And what happens for us here, if we go to understand it, is that the maximum block size caps the throughput. And it's a very simple equation. We get the number, maximum number of people or transactions that fits in a block and divide by the rates of blocks that arrives. That's the number of transactions per second or people per second that the train station can throughput, can go through. And in our case here, it's a blockchain. So number of transactions per second that the network can process. It's a very simple equation, <clears throat> but note that it doesn't matter the CPU, how many CPU you have, it's an architectural limitation. It doesn't matter how much memory you have available. It doesn't matter your bandwidth. It doesn't matter anything. Nope, nothing of these things matters as long as you are in your limits. And that's exactly what happens. Bitcoin limits their transactions in one megabyte per block. As the average transaction in Bitcoin has 250 bytes, 
And the time between blocks is 600 seconds. If you do the math, you can see that there's an architecture limitation. Bitcoin cannot process more than 6.6 .6 transactions per second. It's impossible. And that's basically an architectural decision. Oh, can they reduce the average time between blocks? Oh, yes, they can. It has some consequences, but yeah. Uh, if you remember from our last lecture, the average time between blocks also affects the probability of finding orphan blocks. So, okay, it's a trade-off. <clears throat> and Ethereum, they don't, uh, uh, their limit is not related to the number, to the size of the transactions, but it's related to the number of gas. Uh, we haven't discussed Ethereum here. It would be really nice to have a two hour discussion about Ethereum. They, they are very interesting architecture. They have a very, they have a very interesting architecture, uh, but gas here is just like the amount of computation that you have to do to verify a transaction. So uh, 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 they limit to 15 million gas. And each transaction on Ethereum has an average 21,000 gas. If you do the math, Ethereum is theoretically limited to 47 transactions per second. If you look at the internet, you see some estimates. Okay, Ethereum can process between 15 and 45. What does it mean? Uh, 45, we know it, it cannot go over 47. It's impossible. Because of the, the analogy of the trade station, it's exactly the same situation. It's impossible. So uh, uh, why, why do you see 15? Oh, maybe because of some, depending on the minimum requirements of, of, of their full node. I don't know if there's not many CPUs, they cannot process more than 15. Maybe they improve their algorithms over time and it was 15 at the time, and now it's 45. But no matter what they do, it's impossible. If they don't change the, the settings, it's impossible to go over 47 or 0.6. There's no way. It's an architectural limitation. It's not related to, to the hardware that you choose, to the topology of the network and those kind of stuff. Usually what other networks do to do this is that they, to, to improve their, their TPS, is that they, they violate one of those things that we discussed before. And they, 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 they reduce the time between blocks or they increase the maximum block size. Usually that's what they do. So Hector here, if you take a look, uh, I say that maximum TPS is unlimited. Why? Because there's no such thing as maximum block size. It doesn't exist. <clears throat> and I'll just go very quick here so we can end. We are uh, 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 six minutes after the, the, the regular time. So but what happens here in a very quick way, I can give you more, more details after if you want to discuss is that in Hector, instead of putting the transactions inside blocks, we put transactions outside blocks. The transactions have their own data structure. They're not inside the blocks. They're related to the blocks, but they're not inside. What happens is that we create a DAG of transactions and the transactions make like this, this, uh, 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 this fabric, of transactions. And what happens is that the blocks, they point to the DAG of transactions. Okay. Like they point to the, to the fabric. And what happens here is that between two blocks, there might be any number of transactions. Okay. Between two blocks in a sequence, no matter how, how long, how, how much time uh, 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 it takes to find the next block. There might be zero transactions, one, 100, 1,000, 1 million, 1 billion. Architecturally, there can be any number. So okay. what, what does limit Hatter? The hardware, the minimum requirements. And those are the, 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 the topology, the, all those, all the other things that limit us, our the algorithms we use and et cetera. That's what limits us. Uh, 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 and that's that's uh, uh, that's exactly just trying to, to 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 keep it simple. It's exactly what uh, I came up during my PhD. This architecture mixing these two structures here. There are several other blockchains using DAGs, but they use it in a different way. It's 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 
I, I've never seen one similar. They use it in very different ways because DAG is, is a famous data structure in computer science. It's just a word for a, 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 one data structure. What matters here is not that it's a DAG, but how the DAG interacts with the blockchain, how this consensus algorithm works. And again, we don't have the time now to cover how the consensus works, but the magic is more, more there than here. How can we make the network agrees in a consensus? That's, that's where the magic is. Uh, but again, this, this lecture here was way more focused on integrating with a blockchain than how our architecture works internally. So just a brief overview here. And with all that said, uh, I guess we can finally play the video from the last lecture. And uh, uh, I hope you'll be able to understand what it says. So before going there, uh, just open for some questions. Let's go over the video, Marcelo. Okay, uh, let me just, I'll, I'll share my screen again with the audio shared. Now I have it fixed. It should work. Uh, stop here and share again with share sound for this screen. Can you see it? Can you see my screen again? Uh, yes, okay. Yes? Let's see if you can hear the sound now. The adoption of blockchain in several industries has grown exponentially in the last years, with a Cambrian explosion when it comes to new use cases utilizing this technology, from supply chain to games and digital art. This recent growth has exposed an enormous challenge for the blockchain industry, scalability. In the current state, Bitcoin can only handle seven transactions per second, while Ethereum can handle between 15 and 45. They both suffer from architectural bottlenecks that lead to a broken user experience, namely longer confirmation times and higher transaction fees. Hather has a new architecture that solves the scalability problem and can grow up to thousands of transactions per second. Let's see why. Let's start with Bitcoin and Ethereum. When Alice sends a transaction to Bob, a new transaction is created and placed into the mempool. That's where the unconfirmed transactions are placed to wait for the next block. When a new block finally arrives, it downloads the transactions and arranges them in a Merkle tree inside the block. After the download is complete, the transactions are verified one after another. Finally, once the transactions are verified, the block is ready to be appended to the blockchain. Note that not all transactions are confirmed by this new block. What happens is that the new block becomes full and cannot confirm any additional transactions. It's just, just to, to, to give a note, it's exactly just like the train. The train got full and people have to wait for the next train. The remaining transactions in the mempool will have to wait for the next block to arrive. After the block is added to the blockchain, this block must then be propagated to all peers in the P2P network. Note that all full nodes repeat the same steps. One, download. Two, verify. Three, append the new block to the blockchain. The transactions are confirmed by the network after all full nodes finish appending the new block to the blockchain. And that's how a transaction is confirmed by Bitcoin and Ethereum. Hather, however, has a different architecture that mixes a blockchain with a DAG of transactions. When Alice sends one HTR to Bob, a new transaction is created and placed into the DAG of transactions. New transactions are immediately verified, and they also confirm all previous transactions. So when a new block arrives, it just points to the DAG of transactions. This new block is immediately ready to be appended to the blockchain because the transactions have already been verified. Note that this new block could have confirmed 1, 100, 1,000, or even 1 million transactions. No matter the number of transactions, the block would immediately be ready to be appended to the blockchain because all transactions were previously verified. These steps are executed in every full node as the block is propagated into the P2P network. And that's why Hather is the perfect architecture for your use case. Fast, cheap, and scalable. Hather.
blockchain made easy. Very good. I hope you can. Thank you. I hope you can see a lot of this uh, uh, this lecture and the previous lecture in this video. It kind of it, it's a very simple view of the thing, but I guess it kind of summarizes uh, uh, how each platform works. Uh, uh, Ethereum is a different sense because it doesn't use UTXO model, but it doesn't affect the limitations that we discussed here. They have exactly the same the same issues, so uh, uh, it's valid for them as well. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, just before ending. Uh, uh, I put here an extra slide with a list of extra topics that you'd like. Maybe you, you want the keywords to dig deep uh, 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 because I, I started trading this class with all these topics, but uh, uh, you would kill me and we will have to stay here for the whole Saturday. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting things here. Uh, uh, so I'll just leave it here. And if you want some reference, you can just ask me, okay? Uh, uh, I can send you links and discuss and etc. A lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, for your application, I guess it doesn't matter. It might, there's just one topic that might matter. It depends a lot, but it's the HD wallets, the hierarchical determinist wallets. Uh, the wallets that you are using, they are AT wallets, but I didn't have the time here to cover how it works. It's quite simple indeed, but it's important to understand because there are some, some important details, uh, uh, but yeah, not, not for now. Uh, uh, you, with all the information I bring to you uh, uh, in this class, I brought to you in this class, uh, uh, you, you're good to go. You're good to use and to develop your own, your own, full note, your own uh, uh, integration. And that's it before I stay here. I, I'm open for questions, but I don't wanna get longer. I'm 15 minutes over the regular time. Sorry about that, Carlos. No problem, Marcel. So thank you very much. Uh, you will probably get some emails for supporting some students uh, on, their, uh, on their development of the final uh, task. And thank you very much. It was impressive. It was really very good. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk to I, I to, just, to, to I have, the students. Yeah, I, have a, I have one question. Hold on, please. Sure, go ahead. Sure. Based on the video, so does uh, when he says that uh, in the other blockchain, a block can contain maybe a million transactions. So does it mean that uh, between uh, when the two blocks are created, uh, the, all the number of transactions that are unmarked will be uh, pointed to that block or Every, everything that is uh, waiting online will be uh, will be so we will have a pointer mm -hmm. to the to the block uh, and just making empty the line waiting to be validated so, so that's each and every transaction that is unmarked or that is not linked yeah. to a block would be linked yes to that yes that's the idea and when, when a new block generated, uh, when a new block is generated again, there are waiting transactions. Yes, yes, that's it. Cleans all the line. Yeah. Thank you again, Marcelo. Talk to you yeah. next week. Okay. Thank you very much, Carlos. And I hope I hope uh, 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 your students and everyone here uh, uh, you could learn a bit about a little bit more about how blockchain and how how, how what's inside the blockchain, how it works. And it will be my pleasure to, to give you more reference to study or to discuss, or if you have any questions after, just send to me, I'll be happy to, to, to answer them. So thanks again sure. for the opportunity.